about is how does the unseen realm affect us? God has given us protection. And in a later session, and we might even make it two sessions, we'll go in depth about the armor of God and, uh, and also the armament of God, the sword and uh, the spiritual prayer that we can pray as well. But God has given us protection. But for now, let's look at this passage and we'll talk about the natural fence or hedge. Uh, depending on the translation you have, uh, there is a natural hedge of protection that's around you. And we'll read from verse 6, Job chapter 1, verse 6. And the context here is that uh, Job doesn't know that there's interaction between God and Satan in heavenly realms. All he knows is that he's got a heart towards God and he wants to do everything to serve him. But the story is this interaction that he's completely oblivious to in the unseen realm where Satan is after destroying this godly man's testimony uh, as to the Lord's work in his life. So let's read verse 6. One day the angels came to present themselves before Yahweh, the Lord. Whenever the, the, the Lord is capitalized, it's the... It's God the Father, Yahweh himself, to present themselves before the Lord, and Satan also came with them. The Lord said to Satan, Where have you come from? Satan answered the Lord, From roaming through the earth. Notice that. He is not in hell yet. From roaming through the earth and going back and forth in it. And of course, he's in here, he's got access to, to heaven as well, where God is at the, at the present. Verse 8. Then the Lord said to Satan, Have you considered my servant Job? There was no one on earth like him. He is blameless and upright, a man who fears God and shuns evil. Ha! <laughs> Don't you hear the sneer? Ha! <laughs> There's does Job fear God for nothing? Satan replied. Have you not put a hedge or a fence, some of you have? Have you not put a hedge around him and his household and everything he has? You have blessed the work of his hands so that his flocks and herds are spread throughout the land. But stretch out your hand and strike everything he has, and he will surely curse you to your face. The Lord said to Satan, Very well then, everything he has is in your hands, but on the man himself do not lay a finger. Well, here finally Satan gets an opportunity to do some damage to a godly man, to try to destroy his testimony of God. The enemy strategizes constantly, but if you're a Christian, he has to go to the Lord before he attacks you in any way because you are under the covenant. Whether you realize that or not, when you gave your life to Christ, you were born again of the Spirit. You entered into a blood covenant that God initiated there at Calvary's cross. Calvary's tree, where Jesus took the punishment that every one of us deserve and he freely offers complete forgiveness and the ability, the power for the Son of God to, to become sons of God um, by faith in the Lord Jesus Christ's finished work on the cross. So a blood covenant is a powerful covenant that binds God to you and you to God. So anything that the enemy wants to do in your life, he has to go to the Lord about it. And for reasons that only we will find out in eternity, God sometimes allows Christians to go through all kinds of difficult things. One, I think because of their training. God is training the church, the bride of Christ, for eternity. So there are reasons that God allows the enemy to do things. And sometimes 
There are things in our lives where we give the enemy permission to do something in our lives. And Satan knows from this passage that there is a natural hedge of protection that's around you. And in this case, God allowed him to go beyond that hedge. But there is a natural hedge of protection around every one of us. The trouble is, when we mess around with the occult, like my friend Brian Goff, then we are inviting uh, the evil spirits to come into this physical realm and enable them to manifest themselves in different ways. Now, the enemy uh, loves it when we play around with drugs and that hedge of protection is broken down through drugs. It could be alcohol, it could be... It, all kinds of different things erodes that natural hedge. I personally, I can't prove it from scripture, but I think that that's one of the reasons the enemy is making so many horror movies. Because the negative uh, fear opens up that door and spirits are able to gain access. The more you give yourself to the dark side, so to speak, the more uh, evil spirits are able to interact with you and influence you in different ways. And the more you can cry out, avoid such things, uh, the more you can stay clean, holy, and keep your spirit unstained before the Lord Jesus. When people give themselves to the occult through seances, Ouija boards, and all kinds of other practices, the enemy loves to, uh, to give occult power, but it always comes with a hook. You cannot dabble into the occult without a hook coming into it. The enemy wants to get a hook in you. It's like a door. You know, if you've got somebody coming to your door and you open it, you just may open it just an inch or two and you see it, but the enemy wants to get his foot in the door and, and he pushes and pulls and the more you open the door he's able to get a knee in there and then he's able to get a, his side in there and before you know it he's through the door. There, are, there is a natural hedge of protection that God has got around us protecting us from even seeing these things that uh, are around us. Uh, Chip Ingram, author of a book called The Invisible War, states this, I quote, There is a visible and an invisible world that intersect, and we live in that intersection. Sometimes when people are sick, they may see things in the unseen realm. Often when a person is dying, there are accounts of people and things that they see on the other side. I'll give you a question, just to ponder that a little bit. Have you ever been beside the, the bedside of a loved one or a person uh, that you know and uh, they are seeing things in the other side? And they may not have passed yet, but they are hovering between life and death and often people see things in the other side, often as relatives, I had a close friend of mine in Christine in, in Jerusalem, and she actually died and went to be with the Lord. And as she crossed, as she came back, obviously, to tell me the, her story, but as she crossed, there were all these friends that were all singing to her, Welcome home, Christine. She was a godly woman. She is a godly woman. She's still around, a close friend of mine in Jerusalem. I'd love for, to take some of you. My next tour is March the 30th of next year, and, and I'd love to introduce you to Christine, godly woman that is a woman of prayer. And there are people that are waiting there the other side. So I want to ask you the question. Have you been beside the bedside of a loved one where they saw something of the other side. I'll give you a few minutes to ponder that if you've got a story. Just a few minutes. I'm
2 Corinthians chapter 12. Very interesting passage. We're talking about people leaving their bodies and seeing things on the other side. And that's what we're talking about tonight, this unseen realm that is there if only we can have our eyes open to it. Svetlana Stalin was the daughter of Joseph Stalin, or Joseph Stalin, the leader of Russia from 1922 to 1953. Uh, he is attributed to more deaths than even the Hitler. Such was his evil uh, empire and his murderous regime. Uh, when he died, Svetlana Stalin, uh, his daughter, accompanied her father at death's door and she said that she would never sit alongside an unbeliever who was dying again. That was it, she said. She said that he went into hell kicking and screaming. Voltaire was said to have died crying out in torment. They don't tell us that, do they? Speaking for those who do know God, C.M. Ward said, no Christian has ever been known to recant on his deathbed. I like that. When a Christian comes to that last day, there's no regretting who they serve. Are you with me? They have peace, perfect peace, those who love the Lord and they enter into their rest, their pre the presence of the Lord Jesus. Paul the Apostle records a supernatural experience that he had when he was younger. 2 Corinthians chapter 12, and I'm going to read from verse 1. He talks about himself in the third person. He's talking, but in reality, he's the one that he's talking about, all right? Verse 1, he says, I must go on boasting. Although there is nothing to be gained, I will go on to visions and revelations from the Lord. I know a man in Christ who 14 years ago was caught up to the third heaven. Whether it was in the body or out of the body, I do not know. God knows. And I know that this man, whether in the body or apart from the body, I do not know, but God knows, was caught up to paradise and heard inexpressible things, things that no one is permitted to tell. Obviously, the Lord showed him many different things which he was not allowed to tell. But notice... He is so transfixed by what he's experiencing, he's caught up, he calls it the third heaven. Isn't that interesting? Have you ever thought that maybe there's more than one realm of heaven? That maybe there's three heavens? Have you ever read the first chapter, the first verse of the book of Genesis? You all know it. In the beginning, God created the... Heavens. What? There's more than one heaven? He didn't say God created the heaven and the earth. He said heavens. There are more than one heavenly realms. So, let's think about that. That raises a big question, doesn't it? If the abode of God is in the third heaven, and it could be possible that there's even seven heavens. There's one place where there could be even more. But God... Uh, paradise, he's caught up to paradise and he calls it the third heaven. So if the abode of God is in the third heaven, where are the first and second heavens? Hmm, what goes on there? Now, I personally, I can't prove this from scripture, I personally do not believe that the third heaven is some far-off galaxy that's a million trillion miles away, light years away. I do not believe that the third heaven is a 
physical place. Some people do. They, they say that when you go to heaven, it's somewhere way out there in the darkest uh, depths where there's huge galaxies and star clusters. I personally do not think of it like that. Some say that the first heaven is the physical heavens, and I personally believe that, that the physical universe we can see with a telescope is what the Bible calls the first heaven. Again, I can't prove it, so don't hold me to that, okay? There is no way of proving it. However, what is clear is that there is an unseen realm that is beyond the five physical senses. Call it what you like, the first or the second heaven. But I think it is sufficient to understand it as a different dimension of space-time, where if God were to open our spiritual eyes, like the servant of Elisha, we would see powerful angelic beings, and possibly we might even see evil demons as well. God protects us from that realm so that we are not distracted as we go about uh, our work on planet Earth. Turn with me to the book of Ephesians. You're in 2 Corinthians, so keep going right. You're going to go through uh, Galatians and you'll come into the book of Ephesians chapter 2. Let's talk about this realm, whether it's the first heaven or the second heaven. I think that this unseen realm that intersects with planet Earth is the second heavens. But again, I cannot prove it. In Ephesians chapter 2, we'll read a very interesting verse in verse 1. He's talking to the church, believers at the, the church in Ephesus, and he says this, And you he made alive. Oh, this verse, there's so much truth in this verse in itself. And you he made alive who were dead in trespasses and sins, in which you walked, at one time, of course, according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air. Notice that? The spirit who now works in the sons of disobedience. Oh, we could take all night and just try to explain that. Well, what is that saying? He's saying that until you come to Christ, your spirit, your spiritual man is dead. You function out of your soul. Man's makeup is tripartite. Uh, 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, I forget which verse, says that we are composed of body, soul, and spirit. And our soul is our mind, will, and emotions, our conscience, etc., but our spirit is that part of us which connects with God. And until we come to Christ, we are dead in our trespasses and sins. We don't, we don't have this connection, so we walk this life until we come to Christ uh, out of the deadness of our spirits. But when we give, that's why Jesus said, I am come that you may have life and life more abundant. It's God's life. Jesus came to give us life. The gift of eternal life comes when you believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. The Bible says that John chapter 3, verse 3, no man, what is it, truly, truly, I say to you, unless a man is born again, he cannot see, he cannot see the kingdom of God. But when you give your life to Christ, lock, stock and barrel, so to speak, good English phrase, uh, then you are born again. The Spirit of God comes and sits on the throne of your life. Didn't know you had a throne in your life, did you? But when Christ sits on the, th the throne of your life, you no longer live for yourself. Now, you're still selfish because you are still living out the full life that has been given to you. But all of a sudden, there's a connection between you and God. You've been brought into this covenant where God has brought you out of darkness, the darkness of your sins, and he has forgiven you totally and washed you clean, and you are now able to connect and listen to the Lord. And then he says, 
before you were connected to Jesus, you were one of the individuals that lived or walked according to the course of this world. You, as well as I know, there's lots of people that live around us, that we work with, that they live according to the course of this world. And you wonder why they blaspheme, you wonder why they do the things that they do. It's because they're living according to the prince of the power of the air, the spirit who now works in the sons of disobedience. Let's think about that. He's called the spirit, the prince, the prince is a rank. This angelic being is a prince having a rank, a high up rank, and his name is Satan. The prince of the power of the air. Now, why do you think he's called this? In another place, Jesus himself calls him the ruler of this world. Think about that. What? Satan is with the earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof. But he has been able to gain access through what happened in, uh, in, in the Garden of Eden. We don't have time to go into that today. But the ruler of the world, of this world, is Satan. And Jesus came to do him in. <laughs> First John chapter 5, verse 19 says this. You don't need to turn to it. Again, it's a one-liner. I'd love to save you, but you can jot it down. And it is in the notes. You'll get all of these notes and all that I talk about. There's more that I cannot speak about that are in the notes. He says, John the Apostle writes to the church, he says, we know that we are children of God. I hope that you know that you're a child of God. He says, we know that we are children of God and that the whole world is under the control of the evil one. Did you realize that? Now you know why, what is happening in the world? We can't make sense of it. It's because the ruler of this world, the prince of the power of the air, is having his sway in so many ways. And until the people of God rise up, take action, begin to pray and change things, then we just give more and more room to the enemy to do more and more damage and take more and more ground. Some believe that Satan inhabits a place called hell, but that is not the case. Turn with me to the book of Revelation, chapter 12, where we'll read of a passage in Revelation 12. And I think that this passage that we're about to read speaks of a time that is yet future, that has not happened yet, but is going to happen at some point that's ahead, and we don't know when that time frame will be. We are not told when, we are just told what happens. In Revelation chapter 12, and I'm going to read from verse 7. Then war broke out in heaven. I don't think we're talking about the third heaven, I think we're talking about the realm, the second heaven, where it intersects where if our eyes were opened, we would see these angelic beings and these evil demons. Verse 7 again. Then war broke out in heaven. Michael and his angels fought against the dragon, and the dragon and his angels fought back. But he was not strong enough, and they lost their place in heaven. The great dragon was hurled down. That ancient serpent, yeah, the one that was in the Garden of Eden, that ancient serpent called the devil or Satan, who leads the whole world astray. He was hurled to the earth and his angels with him. Yes, he has angels with him. Then I heard a loud voice in heaven say, Now, have come the salvation and the power and the kingdom of our God and the authority of his Messiah. For the, notice who, who it is, who he's called, the accuser of our brothers and sisters who accuses them before our God day and night, 
has been hurled down. Wow. Yes, Satan at the moment, just as he did with Job, has access and he accuses you before God of heaven. But at some point, he will be thrown down and the world will have a time where there will be great trouble. The context of the passage indicates that he's been accusing us before God for so long. This spiritual venue, this spiritual realm, is the venue of a spiritual battle that's been going on for eons between God's angelic beings and Satan's demons, princes, and angels. The battle is for supremacy over the earth and over each individual person that is born on this planet. There is a war going on for your soul, whether you realize it or not. There is a struggle. Our struggle is not flesh and blood, the Bible says. Satan wants to keep men and women in the dark as to his work in trying to destroy your life. He would rather that we be ignorant that there is even a battle going on. His work goes unhindered if man is unaware of his schemes. He therefore seeks to keep you oblivious to the fact that there is a spiritual realm, a heaven and a hell. The English author, C.S. Lewis, wrote this book. Some of you have read it. The Screwtape Letters. It's a very imaginative book, and it's fiction, but it's based on scripture and how he, how he thinks that this war goes on. He, uh, he, in his preface, and this book is fictional in format, and he focuses on Christian theological is issues primarily to do with temptation and our resistance to temptation. In this imaginative book, Lewis writes in the first person as a senior demon, Uncle Screwtape. And he is in tra he's training his nephew, Wormwood, to overcome uh, Christians and those that are not yet Christians. So he's training this junior demon how to trip up people and how to stop them from becoming Christians. And once they do become Christians, if they become Christians, then his task is to stop them from being effective with their lives and doing any kind of damage to Satan's kingdom at all. In the preface of his book, Lewis explains his thesis in these words. Quote, There are two equal and are opposite errors into which people can fall about the demons. One is to disbelieve in their existence, and the other is to believe and to feel an excessive and unhealthy interest in them. They themselves are equally pleased by both errors, and hail a materialist and a magician with the same delight. On page 31 of the book, as the demon Uncle Screwtape, writing to the junior demon Wormwood, he writes this, quote, I wonder you should ask me whether it is essential to keep the patient, the patient being the Christian, to keep the patient, the person that the demon is seeking to destroy, in ignorance of your own existence. That question, at least for the present phase of the struggle, has been answered by the high command. Our policy for the moment is to conceal ourselves. Of course, this has not always been so. We are really faced with a cruel dilemma. When people disbelieve in our existence, we lose all the pleasing results of direct terrorism and we make no magicians. On the other hand, when they believe in us, we cannot make them materialists and skeptics. I do not think that you will have much difficulty in keeping the patient, 
in the dark. The fact that devils are predominantly comic figures in the modern imagination will help you. If any faint suspicion of your existence begins to arise in his mind, suggest to him a picture of something in red tights and persuade him that since he cannot believe in that, it is an old textbook method of confusing them, he cannot therefore believe in you. For those who are not believers, Satan would seek by all means possible to keep you from receiving and ultimately responding to God's word by believing the gospel. Turn with me to 2 Corinthians. Are you still already in 2 Corinthians? Oh no, you were in Ephesians, so turn left. If you're in Ephesians, then turn left to 2 Corinthians chapter 4. So Satan is busy about trying to keep you in, to, in the dark, first of all, uh, by hindering you from coming to the gospel and giving yourself to the Lord Jesus Christ. And if you are in Christ and have been born again, he wants to hinder you from your growth in Christ and doing any damage to him. In 2 Corinthians chapter 4, Satan is called the God of this age. Notice that. He's called the God of this age. Verse 4. The God of this age has blinded the minds of unbelievers so that they cannot see the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ who is the image of God. The enemy is busy in seeking to blind you from seeing the power that is available to you as a Christian and doing anything against Satan and his angelic beings, evil angelic beings. He's been trying to keep you blind. So, another question, give you a chance to process this. What methods does Satan use today to blind the minds of unbelievers? And has he used any of these strategies in your life at any time.